You want to run tonight, son, or you want to act like a f***ing rabbit? You want to run or you want to duck down? If you want to duck, just go over there and get under the bench and stay there. Well, that's two stupid plays we've made in about the first five minutes. Where's the wing? Time out! Who is it? That's what loses. That's why you won in 15, right there. Anderson! He's in there! Okay, all right, relax. Go, let's go! Oh! Everybody up here, come here. Everybody up here. Get up here. All right, this next series now, we're going to turn this game around. Okay? We're going to turn this game around. You're talking about a kid who is just all heart. Welcome to the Underdog Jets podcast with Wayne Corbett and Robbie Sabo. Welcome back to the Underdog Jets podcast, Jets fans. Episode number four with Wayne Crobet. And today, we're going to do a mix of a bunch of different things. Jets still at OTAs. Tonight, as we're recording this, this is Wednesday night, so they practiced this morning. You'll probably hear this Thursday, Thursday morning. And again, Zach Wilson looked good. The rookies really showed up. We'll get into that a little bit. And we'll also be optimistic. We'll talk about why I think this is the true turning point turnaround for the franchise. And with Wayne here, there's no better guest to have in terms of comparing this situation to what he experienced going into 97. Because obviously the big tuna came to town and a lot changed. So we'll see if we could compare and try to parallel those two off seasons together. Also, Joe Namath turned 78 this weekend, uh, Memorial Day on Monday. And we'll get into that a little bit, see what Wayne has to say about number 12, Mr. Namath. Wayne, how are you tonight? I am doing great. Great to be joining you for our fourth uh, episode. And uh, so far, so good. You know, hopefully get some, uh, some uh, you know, good questions going tonight. Uh, you know, I've been prepared with my answers. So, uh, like I said, keep firing those questions away and, uh you know, we'll try to get to them every episode. That's right. And, you know, they're, for the most part, the ones on Twitter are pretty good. Uh, for those who want to ask Wayne a question, he will answer. Later down the road, we'll do some giveaways with Wayne. But if you want to ask a question, mailbag question, you could respond to one of our tweets or just email us at underdogjetspodcast at gmail.com. We'll try to get to every single one. Um, jokesters, you could, you could throw some joke questions in there. We won't be offended, uh, but, but just make sure they're funny. You know, I think Wayne, keep, agrees them, keep them clean, keep them clean, keep them clean. If it's a <laughs> funny joke and you make us laugh, kudos, you know, we'll, we'll, deserves a round of applause, but the vile right. stuff, I mean, geez, let's, let's, uh, get out of the social media mind. All right. Anyway, today, again, Zach Wilson looked pretty good. I don't think he was as good as the last OTA. There was some ups and downs. He threw a pick or two. Uh, Pinnock, the rookie, had a pass deflection in the end zone. They did a lot of red zone stuff. But the big takeaway is he's playing well, and he doesn't even have his starting receivers out there. Denzel Mims was out there, uh, but he was non-contact all day. He was just kind of hanging around. Corey Davis is injured. So he's getting it done with Braxton Berrios, Elijah Moore, who looks phenomenal. Um. And a lot of smaller guys, a lot of Keelan Cole, uh, Manasaw Bailey even had some time. So right now, everything is trending in the right direction. Wayne, 
was there a moment in time going into 97 where it kind of took you back and you, and you said, whoa, it's different this time? You know, Bill always had that OR around them, you know, of greatness and getting the best out of players. And I grew up a Giant fan, so I grew up watching them, you know, have success with my team. You know, I'll get into it later. My, my wish always growing up was to, uh, my bucket list was to Gatorade uh, Coach Barcells, which always ended up happening. But yeah, when he came in, things changed quick. You know, everybody got in line. Um, and I always say the one thing about him, the best to explain him, you know, is when you're walking around the hall, you don't want to see him. You don't want to run into him because if you're down, you know, you're, you're thinking too much. You'd be like, hey, we'll get, it. we'll get him. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And if you're walking around and you're smiling, you'd be like, what the hell are you so happy about? And it's like, you don't know how to act around him. Like, you're happy, you're sad. You just kind of got to be even keel with him and avoid him uh, as much as possible. But he's a, he's a great coach. Interestingly, I mean, you guys defied the odds, obviously, coming off a of 1-15. in 15. But I'm looking at the odds heading into 1997. You guys were middle of the pack, which kind of surprises me a little bit. That's the Parcells effect. I think uh, maybe 20 or 21st, right behind the Giants. And you guys got off to a hot start that year. Uh, that game in Seattle, was it different right away? Was it different right away in training camp? I know Neil O'Donnell, and for Jets fans, that was a big thing. You know, Neil O'Donnell struggled in 96, and then 97, he he came out firing. So thoughts about that Seattle game, that first game? Yeah, I um, mean, we went out there. You know, we knew we, we played well in preseason, but uh, to come out like that, I mean, and, and lay it on them. They were a pretty decent team. And Neil, Neil came out firing, and it was crazy because after the game, talking to the coaches, and they're like, yeah, we put the bats away. We don't want to beat them too bad. I mean, we beat them, what, 40 nothing? Uh, so to, to start off that way after the my first two years being 4-28 and 28 was just amazing. To yeah, 41-3, to to, to yeah, you guys clobbered them. Yeah, so you could see right away things were, things were different you know, on all levels. And it was in the kingdom. Yeah. And you and you scored two touchdowns. Yeah, I had two in that game. So, it was a, you know, great start for me. You know, I had some success the first two years, but it doesn't matter when you're on two crappy teams like that. So just to get a win to start the year right was uh, was tremendous. Yeah, I, I wrote something this weekend because it rained and it, all my plans were canceled this great Memorial Day weekend. So I wrote something pretty slanted in terms of optimism, you know, looking why I feel it's different this time. Uh, Douglas, you know, it's all about the process. Yes. They care about the results. You know, Bill Parcells, speaking of tuna, you are what your record says you are. Right. But when you're building the program, it's different. You know, you care about the results because you're building, you're starting from scratch. You want to attract the best people. You want to value the process because that's what you're going to repeat moving forward. And Parcells is interesting. It's interesting. It's a little different in that regard because he was everything. He was the personnel guy. He was the head coach. And everything began with him. Yeah. He, uh, <laughs> he actually, when my contract was up, you know, I got an agent. He's going in there talking to those guys. But I'd be out there stretching during training camp. He's like, what do you think? Can you throw some numbers at me? I'm like, coach, man. I'm like, talk to, I don't want to get involved with you. Just talk to my agent, man. So he had, he wore all the different hats, you know, on, on the team, but uh, that was him. He liked to be in control. How detailed did he get there? A little bit, but you yeah. know, he's trying to, you know, undercut me a little bit, but mm -hmm. I said, I don't want, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to talk to you about it. Just talk to my agent, but they took care of me when I was there. You know, he, he said I was one of his guys, you know, he had his guys on the giants and the pats. So uh, it was great. It was great that he felt that way about me. Yeah, it's always interesting. I mean, as long as the respect's there, right? He's always going to try to get a bargain, but as long as the respect's there, I think that's the key. And I think with Parcells and Douglas, uh, the respect is usually there. Yeah, he um, he called me the great Wayne Corbett. That's what I always say. He'd bust my chops. The great Wayne. He's like, because he grew up in Jersey. He's like, I know all the cops. I know all the judges. I know everything. I know everything you do, Corbett. I know what you do at the Jersey Shore. He just would go on. And I tell you, he told me right away, he said, if you don't listen to me, your career is going downhill faster than a dump truck off a cliff with a cement parachute. Oh, That's sweet. creative, man. That is. That's what he said to me. Yeah. So, but I was one of his guys. And if he didn't bust you, 
then he didn't like you. So you, you, you know, if he was quiet and didn't talk to you, then you were in trouble. But if he liked you, he'd razz you a little bit. So I was all good with that. Didn't you have an injured ankle once and Parcells kicked it to test? Yeah, I had a high ankle sprain and it was there in crutches and he just comes and boots me in my ankle. I'm like, you know, jumping, like, what are you doing? He's like, I just want to see if you're hurt. I'm like, man, I'm like, you got you got something wrong with you, dude. But that's how it was. Like I said, if he messed with you, you were good. So you you accepted that. Yeah, I think Lawrence Taylor would uh would agree. Um so yeah, it, it again it starts at the top, folks, with, with these turns turnarounds. It really starts at the top. The players make everything happen. The fans make the business happen, but it starts at the top. And I think a couple key outlines, you know, the hierarchy, like me and Wayne are just talking about, Bill was everything at the top. And now Woody, Christopher, they kind of define that with Joe Douglas. I mean, we, we knew Joe Douglas was in charge prior, but now it's clearly defined where Douglas is at the top, Sal is underneath him, and Sal picks his coaching staff. You know, there were questions regarding that two years ago, but now it's pretty clearly defined. Yeah, it was different two years ago when, uh, you know, Gase and Greg Williams came in. But that's what you have to do. You gave the control to Joe Douglas. You gave him, what, a five, six year contract. It's not going to happen overnight. You know, it's a process. And Woody and Christopher is just uh, being there for support. You know, obviously the big decisions. And he's giving them free range to to go after free agents and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, and it's good that, you know, Coach Sala, I think he's even in a situation where he's just going to manage the team. He's not calling defensive players, right? Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, everybody's got their spot, their place, you know, no, no power control problems. So I think the way they're set up right now is definitely for uh, future success. Yeah. It's, you know, obviously head coaches can call their plays. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But I like the fact that he his ego doesn't force him to call plays. Right. You know, he he doesn't have that ego where okay, you know, I'd ra- I could manage the game, no problem. Right. I could trust my guy, my DC Albrich, coming in from Atlanta, and away we go. And I think if you look at recent history, that's kind of the way it's rolled in terms of the Super Bowl winning teams. Yeah, well, he's I mean, he obviously he's you know installing his defense that he had, so he's part of that part of the game plan. Right. But when you're doing a game and you know you can't focus on everything, you know you have some you know trust in your your defense coordinator. That's good. I mean, I'm sure he's gonna have a lot of input, you know, on uh you know changes at halftime and and, and plays and stuff like that. But uh you know he's doing the right thing, leaving a a little control to some other people. Yeah, and he could uh, kick someone on the sideline if he thinks their ankles not ready to roll you know he don't seem like that kind of guy <laughs> <laughs> he needs a get back guy but yeah he won't kick someone he's not part yeah, yeah. nah I, we, I mentioned before i wouldn't want to be the get back guy with him because he's a fiery kind of guy you know very emotional so uh whoever does that uh does that job god bless him uh, let me ask you this too we may have touched this touched on this in the first episode but the jets winning those two games against the rams and the browns I have, I mean, I shouldn't say never, but fans were more outraged about that than a lot that's transpired over the last couple of decades. In terms of a player, how much does that matter to to win at all costs, no matter the situation? The matter is a lot. Those guys are playing a win. You know, oh, we're going to lose because we want to get Trevor Lawrence. If you lose every game, you're going to be gone anyway. So what's that do for you? For the coaches, why would they want to lose? They're going to get fired if you go winless. So the yeah. fact that they won, yeah, I thought it was great. Great for the players. You know, you don't want to be part of the one of the worst teams in history. So maybe it worked out better and Zach Wilson ends up better than Trevor Lawrence. You don't know that. But, you know, yeah, wins were important for them last year. Yeah, it, it, if you try to work it out for just one player in football, it's never a good idea. You know, my philosophy is do the right thing, try to win every game. And over the long run, it'll be the best because you attract the best people. And, you know, would Salah have said no to Douglas if they clicked, if they had gone 0-16? No. But say they lost those games and the the narrative goes wild and everyone dumps on the Jets. Maybe some guys would think twice about going there. Right. Well, like I said, you can't. Can't can't think of what might have happened. You know, you don't know if free agents wouldn't come there. If you know that was part of it, but the fact that they brought in the right coach made free agents want to come there. 
you know, gets draft picks excited that they want to come play, you know, for, for an up and coming team, like, like the jets, you know, Parcells, did he do anything that was really drastically different? Can you think of anything in terms of, um, you know, putting guys next to each other in a locker room intentionally where it was completely transparent, anything like that, that you said, man, this guy really has, he thinks about certain strategies. He, uh, he, he mixed up the offensive defensive guys, you know, you know, strategically put guys next to each other. But the thing about him was like training camp or some point, he would just cut a player, a veteran. And like something like that just wakes you up like, oh, nobody's safe. And it was uh, that mental warfare that went on. But for some reason, you didn't get pissed. You know, you, you wanted to you wanted to win more. You wanted to run through a brick wall for him. He just had that effect on people. Not many coaches do. And then he brought in his, his guys, too, which is always interesting. How do his guys kind of integrate with the rest of the locker room? Is it loud? Is it obvious? Or is it more subtle? Well, some guys lead by example, and some guys are the rah-rah guys. You know, I remember my favorite, one of my favorite players to play was when he brought in Pepper Johnson. Mm-hmm. That's just a guy that's fun loving, you know, wants you to play hard with him, roots for you, you root for him. So guys like that were enjoyable to play with. And those were his guys, you know, over the years. And I, I think Pepper, I ended up coaching for him, you know, just guys kind of like stuck around, uh, you know, with him their whole careers. Otis Smith is another guy. He was there with the Jets before Parcells, but he strikes me as another Parcells guy over the long term. Yeah, Otis was good. He played in, in New England too. But just another guy, solid vet, solid locker room guy that's not going to let, you know, people start chirping offense to the defense, defense to the offense. You know, you don't need that dissension, you know, in the locker room. And those guys made sure that didn't happen. It, with Parcells, was there more training camp fights than the normal coach? Uh, I don't know. You know, I don't think he really, you know, would put up with that, you know, the fights. You know, it's the kind of thing where, um, you know, you, you, you're kind of not afraid to, but you just don't, you know, you don't want to mess with the guy. You don't right. want to mess with the guy. And he'd, he'd be one for like, just saying, coaches off the field, do what you want. You, we're done. And the coach, he'd leave the field. He'd always good, do that every so often, just leave the field. And we'd be out there like, what do you want to do? Right. So then we'd start doing defense, you know, and offense on our own. And then they'd come back out. But it's just stuff like that. Yeah, see, coaches, they're all different. Some actually encourage fights in, in, in training yeah. camp, you know, nothing crazy, but right. you know, just to get the blood boiling and, and going in the right direction. Um, no, so, I just, he pissed you off enough. You didn't have to worry about fighting. Yeah, that's else. true. Yeah. When I mean, you get cracked in the ankle and you're already hurting, yeah. you know, no, no need to fight. All right. Uh, so Joe Namath turned 78 on Memorial day, as we just, as we previously mentioned, do you remember the first time you met Namath and any Namath stories over the years? Yeah, I I met him like down in the tunnel after a game early in my career, and uh, I think my whole family was at all. And he took a picture with me and my whole family. I think we were thinking about using it as our Christmas card, you know, picture with Joe Namath. But it was weird. I saw him at an event. You know, I talked to him. You know, I always you know introduced myself to him like I've never met him before. And he's like, yeah, you know, what I mean. And this one time we we're at an event, and he's just like, "How's Amy?" Which was my wife. And I was like, "Wow!" I was like, he remembered her name. And that meant a lot to me. It wasn't like, you know, he paid attention when we talked and I've done events with him, autograph signings with him. And he's so, you know, loving with the fans. He's always telling stories. He doesn't sit for autograph signings. He stands so he could shake hands and take pictures. And that's why he's an icon. That's why he's, uh, you know, Broadway Joe and uh, no one will ever be able to, to replace him, you know, on that, in that franchise or he's one of the best ever in the NFL. Yeah. A lot of the younger fans, younger kids, it's it's tough to, and listen, I didn't see Namath either, but it's tough to explain exactly how larger than life he was with with some of the things he did. The guarantee obviously was huge. Uh, it's it's really to me what set up modern football. You know, without him, without the AF, that AFL win in Super Bowl three, who knows what happens with the end of the merger? You know, it quickly came to a close after Super Bowl four once the Chiefs won. And all the off-field stuff too. You know, people forget he he retired uh, with that Bachelor's Three issue with Pete Rozelle. Um, the commercials, the pantyhose commercials. Yeah. Were you ever asked to be in a pantyhose commercial? 
No, nor nor would I do that. He had the the white fur coat. Um, like I say, he's iconic. Some of the some of the things he did, um, and, and the guarantee is great. But they, I watched the uh, Namath um, documentary on him, and just the effect. He was like the Beatles walking through New York City. And he yeah. had all the bottles and actresses, and uh, you know, owns. I mean, everybody wanted to be around them, and I can see why. Just being around them myself, I love it. Yeah, first, uh, I think uh, four hundred thousand dollar contract first. First yeah. to throw for four thousand yards, and that was a ridiculous number, folks. Yeah, fourteen games. Uh, right. AFL. I know the AFL was a little more high flying, and the late sixties started to ramp up, but four thousand yards is absurd. They hadn't seen nothing like that before. Nothing, nothing like that. And and you see, for everyone who wants to say he's overrated, you got to understand those days were different. There were a lot more interceptions back in those days. Look at the numbers. That's just the way it was. Passing hadn't evolved right. yet to what it is today. Right. And yeah, he had, I mean, I think statistically he had more interceptions than, than touchdowns. Yeah. But that doesn't matter, man. He, he, he changed the game and, you know, statistics only don't tell the story. I mean, he got the Super Bowl, but he was a, he was a hell of a player his whole career. And then his talk show, he had a talk show for a season and Muhammad Ali and him on the talk show together was a sight. Uh, I, I, I never saw it, but I, I could understand that would be. Oh man. And you said the girls too, the nightlife he had. Yeah. You know, he wasn't boisterous about it, but you could tell there was like a sort of aura to him. And when interviewers asked girls, what do you think about Joe Namath? They would crack up like, like the Beatles, like you said. Yeah. So the whole package, you know, he was the first athlete, sort of athlete celebrity, I think, him and Ali together. Right. He um, got a, you know, copy of his book. It said, the title is, I can't wait till tomorrow because I get better looking every day. I mean, that's, to come out and, and title your book that, man, you got to know you're the, you're, the, you're the man, you know? All right, Wayne, first mailbag question. Comes from one of Jets X Factor's friends, actually, on Twitter, NYJ Mike, at NYJ Mike. Jets fans, you should follow this man, too, this account, because it's one of the funniest accounts on Twitter, I'm telling you. Him and Matt, both of them. I think they run a podcast called Broadway Jets. They're tremendous, so check them out. The question, hi, Wayne, thanks for being a cool Jet. Speaking of cool, we were just talking about Namath. So right, you're right. in his class, Wayne. Did you yeah. know that? No, I'm not, but I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Best receiver duo in Jets history. And he gives four options. You and Keyshawn, Al Toon and Wesley Walker, Sauer and Don Maynard, Brandon Marshall and Eric Decker. Um, no, it's kind of like the guys I grew up watching, like Wesley and Al Toon. I mean, Al had a short career. But some of the numbers they put up and some of the plays they made, I mean, uh, I think Wesley Walker is one of the most underrated receivers in NFL history. I mean, he had a hell of a career, but the Jets weren't getting much attention. So, uh, you know, everybody in that category, I think, had, you know, great, um, great combinations and some great years. But uh, if I had to pick, I'd probably say Wesley and, and Altoon. All right. Question number two. I don't know how many times you get asked this, but what were – your emotions in the locker room after the Monday night miracle. You know, it's kind of like, I mean, obviously excited, but it's kind of like numb. Like, did that really happen? Like, I mean, I just remember how miserable I was at halftime, how miserable everybody was, but we weren't giving up, but you know, just kind of like, do we think we're going to come back? I don't know. But after the game, you know, me and Laverne are going off the field, like, you know, where our arms are on each other and, you know, just it's kind of night you never wanted to end. You know, I'd say it's magical, you know, the Monday Night Miracle, but it was. I mean, everybody who's there, everybody knows where they were if they were at that game, if they left the game or if, or if not. So, uh, you know, definitely, like I said last episode, one of the highlights of my, not only my career, but of my life. Yeah, I remember I was in my living room at the time, uh, sophomore in high school, I forget. But in high school, in my living room, I definitely remember. And I had a tired day the next day, I'll tell you that, because... Game didn't end until late. And how are your calves feeling? We, we just did the <laughs> Monday Night Miracle episode where, you know, you were cramping up and those trainers were working on your calves. Yeah, that happened, you know, a number of times in my career uh, where I had to get IVs. I remember in a game, even in Buffalo, but it was hot out. I cramped up. So I was in the security room in the tunnel with an IV in. 
when you had the defense was on the field and then as soon as the offense got the field, I run right on the field to, to, to make it through the game. So I had problems like that, but that night I was tired, man. I was dog tired after the game. Question number three, Wayne, who belongs in the ring of honor, but is constantly overseen by the organization and are there Jersey numbers that have to be retired, but aren't. Um, as far as Ring of Honor, they actually ask us, you know, a number of us every year, we kind of get on a call just to throw some names out there. Uh, like I mentioned, the guys are still kind of young, but, you know, the Brickishaw and Mangold, and they should probably go in together. I know mm-hmm. they've done that with other players, but I always bring up Bruce Harper, what he meant to the team. And, you know, he's still around. Um, and you never know with, with Chad and Vinny. I love those guys. I know they didn't play their whole ca- career there. And I met a nice man at the uh, the all all hundred hundred year team, whatever it was for the Jets, was Mickey Schuler. He had some great numbers, had a great car- career there too. So, as far as numbers being retired, you know, mine has never been worn again since I stopped playing. And you know, other guys have had their numbers worn, but um, I don't know what's going to happen if they ever retire my number. If if they do, that'd be ridiculous. But as far as guys, it's guys we mentioned, guys like Wesley Walker. Guys like that, I think he should be the the next one that gets his number retired. Yeah, the number retires retired list is pretty s- small four, right now. There's only four. Yeah, it, and listen, it should be that way in football. Yeah. To be honest, I mean, you have a huge roster. You know, I grew up a Yankee fan, but the way they did it is kind of ridiculous. Yeah, it just becomes too much. It's it, it it devalues how special it is. Some teams actually, you look at their Ring of Honor, and there's like 40, 50 guys. Yeah. Like the Giants have like a ton of guys, guys who were, you know, just okay. And other teams, I see names and I'm like, but our, you know, I think we only have what, 13 or 14 guys in it. So, yeah. I, you know, it's, I feel, you know, special being in it. So, uh, so few, but um, definitely some, I don't think we put somebody in last year, but somebody, one or two guys should probably go in this year. Uh, that question, by the way, was from username at Twitter, GGG. Red Action. This is a one of those gangrene Germany accounts, which is getting right. popular, by the way. Nice. I think they I read today that they might have a game in Germany every year. And oh, I really? do get I do get fan mail and stuff from Germany. So uh interesting. Yeah, actually to the London game this year. People getting back in touch with me saying you coming back up, we'd like to see you again. There's fans all around the world, man. Yeah, UK. UK and Germany are the two big ones. I hopped on a, one of the Germany podcasts a couple of months ago. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, there's fans all over all over the country and all over the year, all and over the world. Not to disclude someone, but the, the question number two was from at Barry Trotz, S-Z-N. Uh, Clear Islanders fan right there. Question number four from... Thomas are known at Twitter. Are you jealous of the current rules protecting receivers? I can only yeah. imagine the type of <laughs> stats you would be putting up in the current NFL. Yeah, man, it's an offensive game. I mean, they can't, you know, between five yards, it can't hold you. You know, uh, the big thing is, uh, you know, they can't hit you from here up, from the knees down. So it's like, and for me, that'd be a small area that could actually hit me in. But um, just, you know, the headshots I got and, the, you know, the clotheslines and, you know, when, when I was playing early in my career, you know, you'd go across the middle and you wouldn't get the ball, but like Romanowski, Zach Thomas, Ray Luth, they just hit you anyway. They bury you into the ground. Like that's was legal. You know, they could do whatever they wanted to. And now, I mean, they can't touch, they can't touch you. You know, it's a shame because a great hit that should be on ESPN, um, shows up as a 15 yard personal foul and the guy probably gets fined 10 grand for it for just right. a really, cause he hit him too hard. So it's, it's a shame that it's how it is, but they do have to protect the, the you know, the product, the players, but uh, yeah, if I played in that, I think, uh, you know, I had a little less headaches than uh, maybe a little more uh, statistics. And, and folks, the, this is episode number four coming out Thursday. Episode number five will be touching on this. We're going to talk about the slot receivers and retiring, you know, the, the tough uh, issues that come from retiring, especially suddenly, like Wayne did. But Thomas's second part of the question is, Amendola and Edelman call you the godfather of slot receivers. I remember that picture. Uh, how does that make you feel? And anything interesting happen at that dinner? That was great. You know, I was got in touch with Amendola, you know, just talking to him. And I uh, said, if you're ever in you know, the area, give me a call. And he said, I'm coming in New York. So, um I said, yeah, I'll take you out. 
get some good uh, good food. And uh, he's like, you mind if I bring uh, Edelman? I'm like, yeah. So he went out and we're just sitting there talking. I had a friend with me and they're like, you know, we don't call you Wayne. We call you the Godfather. And I was like, what? They're like the Godfather slot. I was like, that's pretty cool. And I was humbled because I had as much respect for their game as they had for mine. I know Amendola had a poster of me on his wall, which is, which is great. He gave me a, a, a game jersey uh, signed to me. So, uh, yeah, it's just funny because I think um, – beer spilled or something he's like don't don't spill beer on the godfather it's like <laughs> it's funny and then whenever i uh you know would text with them after a game and tell them they did good or something i always say the godfather approves you know yeah. whatever but it was a good dinner it's a long dinner i've kept in touch with them and uh i, I wish them nothing but success and yeah again stay tuned to episode five because we're going to be touching on that a lot more uh next question from jp on twitter jets F A N I N C L T. What comparisons do you see from the 96, 97 jets off season to the current one? And do you see next season playing out based on Joe Douglas's recent moves? How do you see it playing out? I'm not sure who exactly that he brought in. I'd like to get a list of that from what Bill brought in, but you know, Joe did the right thing last year, Joe Douglas, a lot of one year deals. He didn't go out there and spend. We had a lot of salary up money just to see get a feel if these guys are the right people to, to, to go forward with. And um, he's bringing in the vets this year, you know, they got the, the new and the old, you know, on the defensive line. So uh, he's doing the right thing. He's doing it slow. He's not rushing in there to spend all the money. So it's kind of the same thing, you know, not going to happen overnight, but um, yeah, it happened pretty quick for us when Bill came in, but I think they're taking the proper steps. I'm not rushing it too much. The, some of the guys that they, brought in in 97 it kind of mirrors this season this offseason actually um it wasn't huge uh lorenzo neal fullback otis right. smith who who we discussed already pepper johnson who you touched on already uh jerome henderson uh jerome, they list him as a corner wasn't he a safety jerome henderson I'm not sure. I'm not, I can't remember. And then Demetrius Dubose. So it wasn't a huge list and Ernie Logan as well, who, who definitely right. played on the line. Yeah. Solid guys, solid players. And that's what I say when I'm talking to people, a lot of, not, you know, a lot of not household names, good quality character guys, good locker room guys, good players. And that's what, that's uh, the approach they're taking right now. And of course the draft was James Farrier, uh, Parcells actually traded down from the top pick. So Farrier first round, Rick Terry, Diedrich Ward. This is when Diedrich Ward joined the fold. Terry Day, Leon Johnson, who was an excellent running back. He, he played a role pretty well. And then the find of the draft, Jason Ferguson, defensive tackle. He was, he's one of the more underrated Jets of all time. And they got, and yeah. Parcells got him in the seventh round. Yeah, Ferguson was a good player. A lot of those guys were good players. Cedric had had a good career. wasn't with us a long time, but he made some big plays for us. I remember Jason Ferguson. The, he's a rookie. The first night we're playing, like at Monday night, I think we're at Foxborough or something. And I was like, said to him, "I was like, are you nervous? I'm like, why? I'm like, I don't like. There's a lot of people out there, man. Like, if you mess up, everybody's gonna see. It's like, why you say that to me? I'm, like, I'm just saying. I just want to see if you're nervous. I was messing with him all the time. He was a funny guy." I so haven't seen him in a while. I follow him on uh, on all social media. And just love, love to see some of his posts. But uh, definitely one of my favorite uh, teammates I played with. So Parcells comes in and then you start messing with guys. I see yeah. that. Well, yeah. like, I you know was a veteran and I felt it was my duty to, uh, you know, razz some guys. The hazing too. You know, maybe I won't ask that question. My mind went, immediately went to August hazing, training camp hazing. But maybe that's better left unsaid, right? No, no, no. See, the problem is if you're a draft pick and a high draft pick, you got to get up there, you know, name where you went to school and your signing bonus. Mm -hmm. So they're up there and they got to sing their fight, so fight song. So Hofstra didn't have a fight song. I got $1,500 to sign. No one cared. So I had to go up there and, you know, they got to stand in the, you know, on the chair in the cafeteria. So I just went up there. I sang like three bars of New York, New York by Frank Sinatra. They booed me off stage and they never asked me again. So you just got to do it. But guys, if you'd sang good or you're a high draft pick, you had to do it all the time, man. It was terrible for those guys. I was thinking about uh, hard knocks with Rex Ryan. Right. Where they tied the guy, the DB, I think it was a DB to the goalpost, the loud DB. And they dumped on him. They dumped everything they could find on him. 
Uh, did anyone during the Parcells regime go that far? I think we taped Guy to, to the post. A, a big thing was making guys, we had a pool that was, it's just pure ice. I mean, it was freezing and we'd make them, you know, dunk, go in there and stay underwater and, you know, it's terrible. But, uh, you know, just little things like that. It's singing, they got to go get breakfast and donuts in the morning. Just just to be obnoxious to them, you know, just to, to make them pay their dues. Yeah, it's, it's, that's football, folks. That's what that is. Uh, next question, Christopher from Christopher Lehman on Twitter. Any chance of getting the Jets cruise going again? I figure Woody could get a great deal for fans with cruise lines getting running again, but I'm sure uh. it's as good for players as it was for fans getting greats like you. You know, you know what you would think it would be terrible for, for the players, you know, cause you know, people always want to like bother you and interrupt you with the family. And that was the big thing on the cruise. They weren't really allowed to bother us during, you know, not jets, you know, oriented stuff. And we didn't mind. We were at the pool with the fans, hanging out with the fans, but they had, you know, barbecues, they had like, you know, dinners, signings, you know, all kind of stuff like that. So it was actually very enjoyable. I brought my whole family. I think Beck and his family was there and um, Jason Fabini. There was, there was a couple of guys there, but it was, it was very enjoyable. I would like to do it again to uh, to interact with the fans and uh, just be just be normal with them. All right. Question. Next question comes from at Justin for Ocho at Twitter. Wayne. Who should see more plays in the slot? A current question, Crowder or Moore? That's tough. You know, mm -hmm. Crowder is a veteran guy. Um, they, he's got a big salary cap number, so they have to put him out there. I don't know if they're going to trade him or not, What, what if you've heard anything. But you invest a big pick, a top pick in, in Elijah. And uh, from what I've seen on his film in college, I mean, he's explosive. You know, he's a Tyreek Hill kind of guy. So uh, I don't know, maybe they could put them out there together. You know, they had Edelman on one side, Amendola on the other. So uh, it'd be tough to stop because you wouldn't be able to double either one of them. So uh, I don't know. I, I'm a big Crowder fan, but I'm also uh, interested to see what uh, Elijah could do. Yeah, I think uh, if they don't cut Crowder, you're, I think you're right. I think both of them can play. It's a new NFL. You could have yeah. two of those shifty guys out there at the same time. Look at KC. It, it can definitely be done. Yeah, it makes, them, it makes it really tough to handle. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, next question from Vinny, at Vinny C 89 Hey, Wayne, where was your favorite, or which city was your favorite road city to play in and why? Uh, like I said, the opposite side, the worst place to play was <laughs> Oakland. Those Oakland. people, yeah, it's crazy out there. Actually, people don't realize, but a tough place to play, which was great fans, great fans, was Kansas City. Cause everybody wears red in the stands and the ball's kind of red something on a shiny day, the ball kind of blends in with the fans. It's a, it's a weird thing to think of, but it's like that. But my favorite places to play were like the old, like, you know, Lambo and soldier field, you know, places with history like that. But as far as having fun, definitely out, you know, Miami playing down there. I love playing the dolphins, Tampa. I love playing, you know, most of the Dolphins because it's NF in, uh, AFC East. And then I love playing at Foxborough because those those plays, you know, that place goes crazy when the Jets come out there. So anywhere we got booed loud was uh, a great place to play. How about Buffalo? With, it, with the fans as rabid back then as they are today? It's so, it's so obnoxious that when they score, they do the Hey Buffalo thing, whatever. But they have this Buffalo stampede going on the big screen mm -hmm. when they're kicking off. So obnoxious, but you know, we had some great battles up there, but they're tough to beat up there. And it was always wet or cold. There's no, no fun playing up there. And their stadium's an interesting one too. Like as you walk, it's, it's got the feel of like a college atmosphere, like outside their stadium. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Oakland, that's interesting with Oakland. Uh, you know, one of, one of my best friends growing up was a huge Oakland Raiders fan. And we used to get, we used to battle back and forth all the time. And I used to tell him, tell your fans it's not Halloween. It's not Halloween, 365 days a year. You know, what are you guys doing? Nah, man, that's what they look forward to game day. Those those fans are serious. And they've had, you know, some great success, you know, when Al Davis was there. So, you know, good for them, but not an enjoyable place to play. Another, you know, another one before we move on to the next one, Denver. I heard Denver had some pretty rough fans at times too. Actually, AFC East championship up there, 
after the game, my sister, my, my family comes down. My sister got punched in the face by a fan. From, at Denver? At Denver. I saw after the game, and I went ballistic, man. And the cops are trying to, like, quiet me down. They're like, you're going to get her. I'm like, you got to find out who, you know, hit my sister. It was, it was a tough day to lose, but the fact that right. she got punched in the face by a fan, I was like, man, this, I need to in, get in out In the of stadium here. while the in game the was happening? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And they didn't get, the guy didn't get kicked out either. No. Yeah, I've heard some stories about Denver. Um, it was a, it was a tough night. <laughs> yeah, I've heard some stories. And by the way, speaking of chance, they have the worst chant of all time when the road road offense throws an incompletion. They all chant incomplete. Oh. And this happens too many times a game to do that. Like okay. it's such a ridiculous, meaningless chant. I, I just don't get it. Yeah, if I so never go down. back there, if I never go back there, I'm all right with that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's an outrageous story. Yeah. Um, another question, two more. Zach on Twitter at ZD1570, which receiver are you most excited about in 2021? On the Jets? Yes. Uh, like I said, this uh, Elijah Moore kid could be special um you know i know you know mims is a young kid and i i love the, the addition of you know Corey davis and uh and cole and i think they could do a lot of special things but just i don't know i want to see how this kid more game translates to the pros so i'm excited about all the young guys and obviously crowder you know is going to make his plays but you know i just want to see you know what they saw in him to uh to make him one of the higher picks in the draft Last question comes from Artie Marinani on Twitter. Were you more nervous or excited to go at Ray Lewis when blocking him? I was excited. You know what I mean? I always say my game was part courage, part stupidity, because I made myself believe I could do things maybe I couldn't. But yeah, there was a game where no one was, he was making every play. I'm like, someone's got to put a helmet on this dude. So I went after him. I tried to, um, blindside him and he saw me at the last second and he kind of got me under my under my chin strap and I went down and I was just trying to throw blows and he's like pinning me to the ground and um I was like he got a 15 yard penalty that was great but at, at halftime I'm running in and he kind of runs by me and chips me and smiles at me I'm like all right maybe I got a respect you know what I mean because no one else wanted to hit him but uh yeah that stuff was great I missed that stuff man you know I'd go after anybody on the field especially a crack a crack yeah. option i mean as Until a receiver it doesn't get yeah. better than that but if they see it it's you know you're done yeah yeah you got to catch them from the side unexpected guys like that they got eyes behind the back of their head though they know when it's coming head on a swivel yeah all right jets fans episode four is in the book and we'll be back with episode five on monday wayne any final thoughts from our talk today Nah, I love the questions. It's a nice addition to the to the episode, so keep them coming. Um, like I said, just be clean about it, but I love it. You know, I'll answer any ones you got. Um, thanks for tuning in and look forward to the next one. And folks, yep, underdog jets podcast at gmail.com. Keep sending the questions in. We'll do mailbag as as much as we can. And, and again, we're gonna do some free giveaways too. You know, maybe the best question of the week or best question of the month. We'll figure it out, but you know, a lot of cool stuff coming. <laughs>